Hi, everyone. This is Sam Silverman, Managing Partner of EV5AN. Uh, thank you for taking time to join us on today's webinar. Um, today, we're going to be discussing uh, the evaluation of EB-5 visa investment projects from both an immigration, getting the green card and having it become permanent, and from a securities law perspective with a primary goal of protecting um, the investment that's made into the EB-5 project. Um, today, we have two uh, incredible EB-5 attorneys, uh, Kate and Bruce, who dedicated some of their afternoon to share their years and years of experience working on hundreds of EB-5 projects, um, and we'll introduce them shortly. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this presentation is not legal advice, it's for informational purposes only. You should hire your own legal counsel. Um, this is a quick overview of where we're gonna go today for the discussion, a little bit about EB-5AN, a little bit about Greenberg Traurig, uh, which is the law firm that both of our panelists uh, are from. Then we'll talk about immigration risk, and then we'll talk about financial risk. During the webinar, if there are any questions that we haven't covered, please use the chat box on the screen, and we'll leave a few minutes at the very end to try to cover as many, as many questions as we can. We have a pretty large turnout uh, for today, so we'll, we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. Um, so we'll run through these pretty quickly. So a little bit about EB5AN, as, as most of you probably know, we're a large regional center investment fund manager. Uh, we've worked with more than 2,300 EB5 investors uh, over the last more than, more than 10 years. Um, one of the things that we're really um, committed to as a company is investment transparency. Um, we want to make sure that investors have the full set of information to make their investment decision. Um, EB-5 is complex. There are a lot of different things happening. It's both an investment from a financial perspective, and then based on that financial investment, the investor is soliciting uh, the U.S. government to also receive an immigration benefit. So you've got all of the kind of normal investment terms that go with making an investment, typically in a real estate project, combined with all of that additional language and, and structure that goes along with having your investment qualify for a green card. And so when you combine those two things together, things can get complicated. And so it's really important to get up to speed and really understand how those two items interact. And so we're gonna be talking specifically about that and what uh, investors should be looking for when they start evaluating potential, potential projects. Um, and kind of along those lines, we've published a series of articles on our website um, that talk about key diligence questions. Um, we've got a number of different investment kind of diligence questionnaires that you can download completely free with lists of questions that you should be asking potential EV-5 projects um, just to kind of get that key information in an easily understandable and easily digestible format. Um, every EB-5 project is gonna have its own unique set of documents, hundreds and hundreds of pages, so it can be difficult um, to really compare one to the other. Um, and so the purpose of these questionnaires is to really just isolate the 10 or 15 things that are really important that you wanna be able to compare from one project to the other. And so that's what we've tried to, to accomplish with, with some of our posts and, and available free resources. As I mentioned earlier, I'm Sam Silverman, one of the two managing partners of EB5AN. Uh, my partner, Mike, is also with us today. And uh, my bio is there on the left-hand side. I'll let Mike jump in and share a little bit about himself and kind of about our origin, um, the company's origin and kind of our mission in, in the space. Perfect. Thanks, Sam, and really appreciate everybody taking the time today to join us on this webinar, and I uh, appreciate the time our guests are taking as well to help uh, provide some insight into the industry. So uh, you can see my background on the right. Prior to founding this company with Sam, I was in private equity in New York, and that financial lens is what we take to uh, everything within EB-5. We are very focused on providing institutional quality projects 
that minimize immigration risk. Uh, and we do that by finding under construction deals and also uh, minimizing the financial risk by finding very strong borrowers have strict underwriting criteria. And uh, we've been doing that for over 10 years now, very successfully. And uh, we're happy to have everybody on this webinar today. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Mike. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, we own and operate a number of regional centers uh, that cover most of the country. Here's a quick map uh, showing our regional center network. And now we'll, we'll shift gears and uh, introduce both of our panelists and have them share a little bit about uh, Greenberg Traurig as well. Kate, do you want to go ahead and, and start us off? Sure. Uh, so my name is Kate Kalmakov. I co-chair the Global Immigration and Compliance Practice at Greenberg Traurig. Um, we have a very large law firm of over 2,500 attorneys at this point across 45 offices all across the world. Uh, and we're a multi-service law firm. So obviously we do immigration and Bruce is gonna talk about corporate securities today, uh, but we do the whole gamut of legal work. So litigation, real estate, tax advice, anything you can think of, GT is usually in that jurisdiction and practicing law uh, there. Uh, we've been working in EB-5 for close to 20 years. We represent regional centers, projects. Uh, we do corporate security structuring. We help draft loan agreements. We offer broker-dealer advice. Uh, and of course, we do the immigration filings with USCIS. We've also represented thousands of investors in their EB-5 green card process uh, all the way through until 829 approval and naturalization. We also assist them with securing status while the EB-5 is pending uh, through securing work visas for them or other types of visas that they may be eligible for. Bruce? Thank you. My name is Bruce Rosetta. Uh, just to add a little bit to, to what, what Kate said, um, I am a corporate securities finance and mergers and acquisition attorney. I've been practicing now for uh, 41 years, the last uh, 16 or 17 with Greenberg Trog. Um, my experience in EB-5 is not quite as long as Kate's. I've been doing this since about 2008, 2009, uh, so a little bit shorter time frame. Uh, I represent uh, everything from funds to, in, in case of the EB-5 projects, uh, NCEs, JCEs um, throughout the throughout the country. Um, I also form private equity funds, deal a lot with family offices, uh, and represent a lot of uh, both public and uh, private uh, companies in the securities markets. Great, great, thank you. That's a great summary. All right, so now we're gonna we're gonna dig into the into the details. Um, so, Kate, do you want to? We're gonna start with immigration. So. <coughs> You want to kind of give us a, a general picture on how the EB-5 investment itself works from an immigration perspective and what are the kind of key things investors need to be aware of as they start to explore doing an EB-5 investment themselves? Sure. Uh, so EB-5 had a number of changes last year with the passage of the uh, RIA. Uh, which is the Reform and Integrity Act. It implemented a number of changes in EB-5 law that impact investors. And of course, the price went up, which was you know, the first price adjustment since the program was initially introduced in 1990. So it was an adjustment for inflation. And this is the investment amount that you can see on the screen for the next five years. Um, the general investment amount is a million fifty thousand. However, most projects are at an eight hundred thousand investment amount, and that is determined uh, if a project is located in either a high unemployment area defined as 150% of the national average. And in EB-5 talk, we call that a targeted employment area or a TEA. Um, it can also apply to a project that is a government infrastructure project or a rural project, which is defined by the U.S. Census and which can be looked up fairly easily as those designations are for 10 years. When an EB-5 investor is choosing whether or not to move forward with the application, 
key things for them to consider are from their side, can they show and document the source of their funds? So the US Immigration Agency and US Public Policy is of course very concerned with making sure that money that enters the US is lawful. So we have very stringent requirements. We have to show the source of the money from the time it was earned all the way through until investment into the selected EB-5 project. And we also show, have to show the path of funds. So we have to show the movement of funds through accounts uh, all the way through until the time of investment. The new law also requires that we present tax returns. And if tax returns are not available because perhaps you live in a jurisdiction where they're not required or they're paid for by your company that employs you, we have to explain that as well. And it is a very fulsome analysis to present a source of funds uh, to the USCIS. We also need to decide what is the project that you're investing in. And Bruce is gonna talk about what factors to look in and look at when you choose a project for investment. But of course, most investors want to go for an $800,000 project versus a million fifty thousand because at the end of the day, the green card that you get is the same. So many are investing right now in what we call visa set-aside categories. These categories were also introduced in the RIA last year. So we had the TEA concept in the old DB5 law. Now we have a set-aside devoted to it of 10%. A rural project, those get 20% of the visa set-asides and government infrastructure projects get 2%. What does that mean? That means that investors applying in those categories should get priority processing from USCIS. It means currently they're not subject to backlogs or visa retrogression. Uh, the US gives 140,000 employment-based green cards annually with 10,000 reserved for the EB-5 category. Within the category, no more than 7% can go to any one country. So that's how quotas develop and that's how backlogs develop. So right now, because uh, the RIA changed the law, everyone is current that is applying. And we may see changes in that depending on the volume of applications received in particular categories, but they are a priority. And the stated goal of the USCIS is to adjudicate those petitions in 180 days. Has that happened yet? Um, no, but uh, it is their goal. They definitely lost a lot of staff during COVID. And so they have stated that their goal is to reduce processing times and to hire more adjudicators. So I sincerely hope, and the director has said it in public, that her desire is to bring the processing times down and to meet the stated objectives. So when you're selecting a project for immigration, there's a number of factors that you should be looking at. Has this regional center done EB-5 in the past? Do they have experience in the industry? What is their track record of approvals for I-526s, which is the initial EB-5 petition? How many of their investors have been able to remove the condition? So the EB-5 requires that you invest 800,000 into a new commercial enterprise. That new commercial enterprise is supposed to create 10 jobs per investor. In regional center projects, that happens through indirect employment creation. So usually it's the spending of money um, that generates through an economic model a certain output of jobs. And if a business is not able to meet the objectives of their business plan, if they're delayed for some reason, if they don't secure financing that they were relying on, they may not be able to evidence job creation at the eight to nine stage, which could potentially impact a person's immigration. So it's very important to consider that. They also need to consider how long their money will be invested for. Uh, previously under the old law, we had to invest money until the time of 829 filing. So the statute of the RIA says that the investment period is for two years, it changes it. 
but it's not clear and we don't have regulations from the agency yet. So we don't know when does the two years begin to toll. Does it toll upon filing of the 526? Does it toll upon release from the project's escrow account? Does it toll from the time the money is received in the escrow account? That is something that we expect immigration to clarify when they issue regulations. Regulations by any agency are subject to notice and comment under the Administrative Procedures Act, and so we expect to get clarity on that within the year. So when you're looking at projects and how to select them, it's very important to look at sustainment period to consider perhaps it's safer to have somebody hold my money for longer to make sure that whatever is decided with the regulations that your investment is meeting the sustainment period. It's just something to consider for any investor. So on the screen here, you see the timeline of receiving the EB-5 based green card. Uh, of course, the timing fluctuates because as I said, there have been numerous delays post COVID with the immigration agency. And prior to COVID, we were filing and getting decisions much quicker than we are today. But again, they have stated that their goal is to work on that and rectify it, and I am confident that they will. I certainly hope that they will. But if you look at the processing times today, if you file the I-526E, which is the actual EB-5-based uh, immigrant petition, it's taking about three years to get approval. And then if you're overseas, you can process at the consulate overseas, and they'll issue an immigrant visa to you. Once you get the immigrant visa, the first day you enter the United States is when your permanent residence status commences. And then you need to toll 90 days prior to the two-year anniversary of that entry in order to file your I-829 petition to remove conditions where you show that you sustained your investment for the requisite amount of time, that the project created the jobs, and then you get the permanent green card. If you are in the U.S., the Reform and Integrity Act introduced a concept that we as immigration lawyers have used in other immigration categories that is incredible. It allows you to file the I-526E concurrently with what we call an application for adjustment of status. So you adjust status from a non-immigrant to an immigrant. You can process your green card in the U.S. If you're in F1 status, if you're in B2 status, if you are on a work visa, and you and your dependents can remain here while it's pending and also secure work and travel authorization. So that has been very welcome news for many people. We have a lot of students who are finding it hard to secure employer sponsors, it takes a very long time. So they're really loving that they can file for a work permit and not be dependent on sponsorship to secure a job. Now, one thing that is not on this chart here, but that I have to mention is that 90 days prior to the five year anniversary of getting your initial conditional green card, uh, the individual can apply for naturalization. And of course, many of our clients choose to. And in addition, I do want to mention that the visa set aside categories are supposed to have a shorter processing time than what you see here. Uh, so a rural project can shorten the processing time certainly because it is priority processing. The US government's objective is to funnel investment into rural areas. And so the RIA sought to identify that as a need and to assist with that. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so job creation. This is sort of uh, the crux of the EB-5 program. Initially, when the EB-5 program was introduced in 1990 and the Regional Center program was introduced in 1992, it was a time when we were really trying to bring foreign direct investment to the United States. And this program was conceptualized as a tax as a way for American taxpayers to not pay anything to bring in foreign money into the US and to ensure that it creates jobs. And this really sets aside the US investment program for many of the other overseas investment programs, the Caribbean, the European, 
we need job creation in the US and so it has to be met. As I said, it's 10 jobs per investor. And when you invest into a regional center project, I previously mentioned an economic model. Well, the economic model allows a regional center to capture jobs, not just at the project itself, but jobs that are generated in the region as impacts through the investment. And so the benefit of that is it's indirect job creation. And the benefit is that you get a lot more jobs than you would if you were just creating jobs directly. So for example, if I invest into a hotel, I'm not looking at just the W-2 employees working at the hotel. I am looking at how much money was spent to construct the hotel, how much money was spent on hard costs and soft costs and to operate the hotel. And I end up with a lot more jobs than just the W-2 employees on site. And so when the program says you have to create 10 jobs per investor when you're reviewing a project to invest in, it's always good to look for a project that can give you even more jobs per investor. It gives you a cushion in case any are disallowed. And so that is something that I think is very, very important. And if you look on the screen here, we have a beautiful chart created by EB5AN. They're very skilled uh, with the charts, and I love a good visual. Uh, so you can see that you're looking at both direct jobs and indirect jobs if you look at the last column. Um, and that's great because investors get 24 jobs each. And so you're more secure in the EB-5 project meeting the requirements. Next slide, please. Thank you, Kate. Before, before we jump to the next slide, could you touch a little bit on the concept of job creation happening you know before the investor actually joins the project and how uscis rules you know apply in a situation where the project's been going on but the investor's coming in in the middle how does how, how does all of that work well the answer is it's permitted and it's even permitted for the project to have begun with other financing or bridge financing this is part of the ria it's now part of the law um, and the investor can still capture those jobs because when we look at the money being put into the project, we're not just looking at the EB-5 money going in, we're looking at the totality of the project. And so the project, even if it began earlier, even if it's mid construction, even if it's nearing the end and we're using EB-5 to replace the bridge financing, we can capture those jobs and allocate them per investor. So, you know, sometimes clients get nervous because they think they won't get credit for it, but it is important to consider it when you're weighing your due diligence because we've seen other projects that perhaps, you know, have purchased the land and are still waiting to secure other financing or to raise EB-5 to move forward and it's delayed or it falls through or they're not able to and the project just doesn't move forward at all. So many investors choose to, uh, to look at projects that are underway or that have other financing where the EB-5 is taking it out because they have some assurance that the project is actually going to be completed and the job creation met. Got it. So from from a from an immigration kind of risk perspective, you know, there's there's kind of two sides of of the equation, right? Like the the riskiest would be a project that, you know, maybe has only the land where no job creation has happened because you don't get job credit for purchasing land. So they own the land, but no money's been spent on construction. So there's zero jobs in the job bank toward the 10 that are needed. Whereas the other side of the equation or spectrum, the, the kind of lowest risk option is a project that is well advanced, has a lot of jobs already created, ideally more than the 10 that are needed for the investor. and you know, can can you do any better than that? Or is that, you know, that's kind of the best, the best an investor could hope for is something that's well under construction and it has more than the 10 that are needed. Yeah, I mean, I think that's ideal, right? 
the program requires that the money is at risk, but it doesn't require that you put money into a risky project, right? You're as an investor, you have to weigh the immigration benefits with the investment benefits. So we want to make sure that you know, in many cases, the project is underway, that it is going to move forward, that it is going to be completed, that financing is in place. That's very important, especially now yeah. in today's environment. Exactly. Yeah. Interest rates are up and a lot of people who thought they could borrow funds, you know, a year or two ago are, you know, having issues because now the number of loan dollars you can get is, is going to be a lot lower and operating costs are significantly higher. Yes. Um, I think there's one other factor there, just to interrupt for a second. And that, and that is there are a lot of loans that may be out of balance, that they may have had the full financing in place, but because of increases in interest rates or increases in, in construction costs, they're now out of balance and, and the senior lender comes back to the developer and says, we need more equity dollars. It's not always there. Um, right. So we can talk about that more when we get to my 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 part of the slide here. Um, but I thought it was important to sort of put that in oh, place. Yeah. <clears throat> yep, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> Kate, I know you, you touched on briefly earlier the concept of these set-asides. Maybe, maybe we don't have to go through each one in detail, but just give us the concept. What, what do these set-aside categories do? Why is it kind of unique and better, favorable for more for new investors now versus, you know, investors from a year or two ago? Well, the first benefit is that the slate is sort of clean. We have a long backlog for previously filed cases for individuals from certain countries like China and India. Right now, choosing to file in one of these set-aside categories has no backlog. So, whereas you may have a Chinese national who previously filed and has been waiting 10 years, uh, they can file all over again in a rural area project, and they're not subject to the retrogression. They just have to wait for the USCIS processing times to get their green card. So, that's a huge benefit, and it's really sort of breathe new life into EB-5 for many people. Um, also, you already know what kind of projects are going to be prioritized and looked at first because they're telling you under the RIA. We want mostly rural project. We're giving them the largest allocation, 20%, followed by 10% for the high unemployment TEA and 2% for government infrastructure projects. So they're telling you already how they're going to prioritize new applications. And if any of the categories that are set aside don't meet their caps for the first year, it's reallocated the second year to them. So they will have even more spots. Uh, so it's very important and it's been a huge draw for many investors. Got it. And we'll spend a little more time on that when we get to the visa bulletin slide as well. But just that's that's a that that's really good context. Um, I guess talk talk to us a little bit about this priority processing for rural projects. What what does it mean? What do we know so far, even though it's early? And you know, how does that kind of factor into comparing a rural project versus a non-rural project as you know the immigration attorney for for a potential investor? So we know during the congressional hearings uh, when the EB-5 program was suspended and the RIA was being debated in Congress that there was a huge push by many uh, members of Congress to funnel money into rural projects. You know, they want to make sure that rural areas are receiving foreign dollars that they're available for development. And so the set aside category of 20% was born. And as you can see in the RIA itself, it says that we shall prioritize processing of rural applications. So we expect those I-526s will actually be adjudicated faster than others. And certainly those people who were previously in line who filed under the old DB5 law, unfortunately, they will also be behind the priority processing of the new applications. So they're really giving attention to them because they want to make sure that the dollars are going to rural areas. We don't know exactly, and this is sort of the million dollar question that everybody that I do consultations with and meets uh, wants to know is, well, how long exactly is it going to be? We don't know. Uh, the program, you know, really was 
passed last year in March, implemented in May. We had some litigation. So most people started filing applications in August and September of 2022. So I expect that we should be receiving adjudication soon. But to give broad trends on exactly how fast it will be, we don't know exactly. Got it. Got it. I guess on, on the concept of priority processing, is this is this a completely new concept for USCIS or is this something that that they have had in the past, but just not for EB-5 and, you know, kind of looking at where they have had it, like, has it been a material difference versus, you know, categories and visa processes that didn't have it? Or, you know, does that even exist? Yeah, we didn't really have it in other immigration categories. We had something called premium processing, where you pay an extra fee, $2,500, and you get a decision in two weeks. And there are certain employment-based immigrant categories, like extraordinary ability aliens, those are the people at the top of your field, multinational managers and executives, who could pay that fee, get a decision, um, in two weeks and get a decision on their case. But this is not premium processing and premium processing is not being introduced for EB-5. Priority processing means there's a line and these people are gonna be ahead of the other people, but how quickly, uh, we don't know for sure. Got it. So what we what we really know is this, this is gonna be the fastest way to get the green card. How fast, we don't know, but you're gonna be in the fast pass lane and you know however long that ends up taking it will you know should be faster than you know the other lanes that are open yeah got it got it okay so let's t tell us a little bit about this visa bulletin what is a visa bulletin why does it matter and i'm sure you saw earlier today india the eb1 category retrogressed 10 years approximately I saw. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let's, after we go through this visa bulletin, let's spend a minute or two and kind of, you know, give the context for what that means and how that retrogression kind of contrasts with this current, you know, nature for EB-5. Okay. So everyone bear with me a little bit because now you're going to have an immigration lawyer somewhat explaining that. Uh, so as I told you before, the U.S. gives out a certain amount of green cards every year, and it's 140,000 in the employment-based categories. Within the employment-based categories, we break them out further into five categories. Employment-based first preference are those super-duper extraordinary ability aliens that I talked about. So these are your superstars in whatever field they're in outstanding researchers and professors, and multinational managers or executives. They get 10,000 visas. Second and third category are workers. So in the second preference category, we have people whose immigration is in the national interest or people who are going through a company sponsorship and have a master's degree, and the position requires a master's degree or higher, and they can show that they have it, and exceptional aliens. The third preference category is for skilled workers with a bachelor's degree or higher, or unskilled workers. So these are the people, think about factory workers, chicken processing plants, people on the line, the fourth preference category is uh, for religious workers, special immigrants, and Iraqi translators. And then the fifth preference category is your EB-5 workers. The EB-5 is also split up. Uh, we have direct EB-5 offerings where you have people making an equity investment into a business and you have people in the regional center program. Within the regional center program, we also have the new visa set aside categories, which you can see. You can see the general pool broken out and then you can see the visa set aside categories. So when there is the letter C next to a particular category, it means it's current. And that means you can submit your 
immigration application, not your I-526. Your I-526 is presumably pending, but it also means that you can pursue your immigrant visa, which is the document that you need to enter the U.S. and get the green card, or your application for adjustment of status, which is your green card application. So if you are current, you can now file, as I said before, your I-526 and wait for it to be approved if you're overseas and process at the consulate, or if you're in the US, you can choose to do it concurrently at the same time, or you can file your I-526 petition and then decide six months later, I'm still current, I wanna submit my green card because I wanna get work authorization, I don't wanna work for my you know, employer anymore, I don't wanna be tied to a work visa, I wanna work for whoever I want, I'm gonna apply for work authorization. So you can do that either at the time of filing or at any time afterwards. Where you see the dates on the visa bulletin, and the visa bulletin is issued monthly by the Department of State. And basically what they're doing in the visa bulletin is they're monitoring how many visas they're giving in each category. And so if you look, you can see that Chinese nationals are backlogged. So as I said, 10,000 visas in EB-5, and for people who filed under the old law um, or not in one of the set-aside categories, they cannot proceed to file their green card application until their priority date becomes current. The priority date is the first date that the I-526 was filed with the USCIS. And so if you look at China, you can see that the backlog is quite lengthy. It's September 8th, 2015. Uh, those people who filed their I-526s on that date or earlier can apply for the green card. If you filed later, you're in a backlog. You have to wait. And uh, in the August visa bulletin, which came out today, um, <clears throat> we saw a huge backlog in EB-1 India. So I do a lot of EB-1 cases. I work a lot with extraordinary ability aliens, these amazing people who are superstars. And I also work a lot with multinational managers because I, besides doing EB-5, do a lot of business immigration and represent a lot of companies who bring their employees here. Today, um, we saw this date go back 10 years for till 2012. So the employment-based first preference was another way, if you can meet these strenuous requirements of multinational manager, extraordinary ability, or outstanding researcher, and they're difficult to meet, that many applicants were applying for a green card. But India, with its very well-educated and uh, numerous population, has exceeded their quota, so they retrogressed it back 10 years. And we expect, because of that, that we're gonna see a lot of Indians now applying for the EB-5, because if you look down the visa bulletin, besides religious workers and, as I mentioned, certain special immigrants, the fastest way remains for them to do EB-5. So, um, you know, it, this is something that needs to be monitored monthly, and usually the government slows down its visa issuance towards the end of the year. The government's fiscal year runs from October 1st to September 30th. So as we get to the end of the year, they're seeing that their visa numbers are running out, and that's why you see things like that, which is the retrogression, because they've realized they've used up their visa numbers. In, in case, uh, I think that that's going to be one thing that a lot of our viewers have a question on is how can that happen where all of a sudden it goes from 2022 to 2012 like what happened so is it purely a it's so towards the end of the year a and cards and now they realized hey we're running out india's reaching its seven percent maximum in eb1 we have to slow it down and retrogress it got it got it so, so a, a couple of follow-up questions there. So these set-asides, the 32% in these three new set-aside categories at the bottom, how do, how do those interact with the fifth unreserved? Like what's the, what's the interaction between those two? Good question. Okay, so people who filed under the old law, I get this question a lot. 
they cannot upgrade their petition to be in one of the new visa set aside categories. Even if the project they picked in 2018 was a rural project, there's no way to change it. This is only for applications filed after the implementation of the RIA. Now, there is a chance that these percentages that you see 20, 10, 2 are used up because many people are going to try to get into the categories. And so it's very important to try to file as quickly as possible to secure your spot in them because presumably once this is used up, you're put into the general pool of remaining EB-5 visas. And as I said, there's 10,000 total in the category. So if we have more than 10,000 applications um, or a lot of applications from one country versus another, we can go back to a scenario potentially where we're in a retrogression. So with the new categories, of course, the people filing first um, or you know now while it's current are going to be able to secure a better spot than those later on. Got it. And so just, just going through a hypothetical example here. So everything is current today, but, you know, most likely, you know, after some period of time, maybe it's eight months, 12 months, 16 months, whatever it is, eventually, just given the demand, the same thing that happened, you know, years ago, um, which has caused, you know, those two red priority dates there will eventually happen for these new set aside categories. And so keeping that in mind, you know, if I'm an Indian software engineer working at Amazon and I invest today, you know, what's my what's my real benefit that, you know, I don't know exactly how sure, long it's going to That's a great question. And one is you're securing to, your place yeah. in line. But two, if you file while it's current, you can do the concurrent filing. If you wait for it to be retrogressed, you may not be able to submit your green card application later on because your visa number has to be current to file concurrently. So if I'm an Indian engineer, as you said, and I see that many Indians may be applying, or even just the EB-5 resurgence is you know, making demand very strong, I'd wanna get my application in now so that I can file my adjustment of status and secure an EAD. You know, the EAD, has an immeasurable benefit. It doesn't require an employer sponsor. If you're tired of working with the same company, you don't have to go out and find somebody who's gonna file another H-1B for you. You have blanket work authorization. You can choose to work, you can choose not to work, you can take some time off. You have that flexibility. You know, if you're an H-1B and you're terminated, you have 60 days to leave the country. And if you haven't filed your adjustment, what's your ability to stay here? Got it. So, 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 so obviously there's, there's a quota issue. There's a number of visas that are available in each of these categories, but like, is there any quota with respect to the EADs? Like, how does that, no. like, for example, no. let's, let's say they're only handing out a certain number of visas per year and the number of applicants today far exceeds the visas available. Can everyone still adjust status and get that EAD now, even if they're going to face a longer yes. waiting time for the green card later? Yes, and that's the huge benefit and the change in the law, that even if there's a retrogression, look, I came into the US and I filed my adjustment or I was already here and I filed my adjustment, I have the ability to stay in the US. I have the ability to put my kids in school, even if it takes three years to process. I have the ability to work, I have the ability to travel. I'm not dependent on another status or I'm not forced to sit outside the US. And there's absolutely no limit on that. Literally 100,000 people could apply for EB-5 tomorrow and every one of them could successfully adjust status. And yes, it would take a lot longer than expected to get the green card eventually, but all of those people could adjust status and the government would just hand out an EAD for everyone you know, who qualified. With the caveat that they're in lawful status in the US, so you have to be in lawful status to adjust status. And, you know, obviously that they meet the adjustment of status requirements, right? So, but right. that's a separate discussion for another time that you're not inadmissible because there was some crime in your past or something else that perhaps would make you inadmissible. But generally the answer is yes. Got it, got it, perfect. 
And one one last comment on that before we shift over to the project side. How does how does that work permit kind of interact with the ability to travel? What what do investors also need to think about if they want to travel internationally and they're going to get off their H-1B? So uh, if you're on an H-1B, I would suggest staying on an H-1B, filing the adjustment and waiting for your advance parole document to be issued because they are taking a little bit of time, anywhere from six to 10 months from the time of filing the adjustment. And if international travel is important to you, part of your job, you know, the H-1B as opposed to a student visa or a tourist visa, it gives you the ability to have a green card pending and work on the H-1B. So you can travel on the H until you get the advanced parole, and then you can stay on the H or you can move to the EAD. At that point, you have the flexibility to do what you choose. Got it. Okay. And so la last thing is for investors who, you know, are now seeing this large retrogression for EB1, you know, particularly for India, you know, who are saying, oh, well, you know, looks like that door is closing. Now, you know, I, I really need to get serious about EB5. What, what are the next steps for someone like that, you know, if they wanted to explore doing an EB-5 application with you and your team. How long is it going to take? What documents do they need? You know, how long before they can apply and, and get that EAD? So it typically takes us like two to three weeks to put together an investor petition as long as they get us all of the required documents. There's going to be sort of two sets of documents that we need. For the adjustment, we're going to need biographic documents, birth certificates, marriage certificates, divorce certificates, employment history, educational history, you have to get a medical. Uh, for the EB-5, we need the source of funds documents. So if you're an H-1B and you've been working in the U.S. and your source uh, is your salary, then we're going to need information about your salary and your tax returns. If the source of funds comes from overseas, you know, the beauty of EB-5 is it's very flexible what your source can be. And it can be a combination of sources. So it can be a sale of real estate, it could be a sale of stock, it could be divorce, uh, money you got awarded in a divorce, it can be salary, it can be a gift from parents. I even had somebody I did an EB-5 for who was a professional poker player and used his winnings. So it can be anything as long as we can document it and it's lawful. And we work with investors, they can contact us by emailing uh, for a consultation to you know, tailor the list of documents that we need from them in order to file a successful EB-5 petition. Got it. Thank you very much, Kate. That, that's super comprehensive. And we've heard nothing but positive feedback from our clients who've used Kate and her team over the years. So if that is of interest, you know, given this recent change literally today uh, on EB-1, it's definitely something to look into and at least get the full picture of what it would look like, how much it would cost, and what the benefits would be, and how long it'll take, you know, to to get those. Yeah. All right. So so now we'll shift gears and chat a little bit about now now that we've kind of covered the immigration side, what's the benefit, the the benefits plural, because um, we now have the concurrent filing that are available. Now, how do we safeguard the investment? We know it has to be at risk. But like Kate mentioned, it doesn't have to necessarily be unnecessarily risky, but it does have to have some element of risk in order to qualify for the EB-5 program. Um, so with that, um, Bruce, do you want to kind of walk us through a couple, a couple of these major buckets and topics that you know you always want to be keeping in mind as an investor is considering, you know, one project over another, and then. Um, we, we can get into some follow-ups on, on some more specific questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so to begin with, really, what I want to do is make sure that when you're looking at, at the risks, the risk can go from, you know, very small, it's never going to be zero, right? There's always going to be risk in any project uh, to, to a very, very high level of risk. So when looking at any project as an EB-5 investor, whether you're coming in as a, a lender or perhaps as a preferred equity investor, you really want to put on a hat as sort of like an underwriter at your bank and you want to assess the risks that are inherent in the in the loan um, and there are a lot of factors that you're going to look at when, when, when you do that right so this is all about making sure that the risks are measurable and that you're comfortable with them um, understanding what those risks are um, assessing it 
and then ultimately making sure that not only are the risks comfortable for you, um, but also that the jobs are being created as, as was expressed uh, by, by Kate and Sam in the prior portion of this, of this presentation, right? So um, everybody needs to really put on their due diligence hat, as I said, and act as, a, as an underwriter. Um, one of the, you know, one of the first questions that I would look at is when looking at any project, who the developer is and what is their track record of success? Um, do they have a long track record of doing a lot of development and completing those developments, you know, on time and on budget? Um, is this the first EB-5 project that they have ever, have ever done? Um, and, and so on, right? And that's, that's going to be an important metric for you. Um, Additionally, you want to look at whether or not they've had failed projects. Many developer supports will have uh, projects that have never failed. Some projects uh, are going to be, uh, it's going to be more evident that they've had struggle uh, completing projects on time and on budget. And obviously, that's a risk that you want to weigh. Another a good measure here is, is taking a look at the you know, financial wherewithal of any developer. And that's where the balance sheet comes in. Um, I would recommend that everybody looking at any project take a look at not only the balance sheet of the developer, but if there's a guarantee involved, the balance sheet of the guarantor, um, because you want to make sure that they have the you know wherewithal to go through this project and should something happen that they can support the project uh, and help get this project to a successful ending and the creation of the jobs. You can uh, turn the slide. Additional uh, metric that I always want to look at too, um, because this really impacts, uh, I think, to a large extent, um, whether or not the loan documents or the investor documents that you're receiving are sort of fair and balanced. And so what we look at here is whether or not the general partner is wearing more than one hat. Um, certainly if the general partner is involved both on uh, controlling the um, NCE, as well as being an affiliate or controlling the, uh, the, um, uh, the JECE, there's going to be an automatic conflict of interest. And then the question is going to arise as to whether that developer uh, is really incentivized to provide a fair deal, if you will, to the investor or the lender or, or not. Um, so you're going to need to take a look at the loan documents very carefully, and, and that's where we can come in to help you, right, uh, to make sure that they, they, are, they are fair and balanced and that there are favorable protections uh, for the investor. Um, if, the, if the GP, as part of those loan documents, has waived its fiduciary duty, then they're basically telling you up front, um, they're not responsible for acting on your behalf as an investor, um, as a fiduciary. That should be a red flag to you, um, and you should look at those provisions very carefully and decide whether that is something that you're going to be comfortable with. You can turn the slides out. Before we move to the next slide, can you kind sure. of give us, uh, walk us through like a hypothetical conflict of interest situation where, you know, if the general partner and the project borrower, you know, were controlled by the same person, like where does that, obviously if the project gets built, you know, exceeds expectation, is highly profitable, you know, not going to be an issue, but where's, where's the most kind of common situation where that kind of a conflict can be, you know, negative for, for investors. Yeah, where I basically see the conflict of interest is, and, and you're correct, I mean, the fact that there's a conflict of interest does not mean that the project is not going to be built, uh, that there's not sufficient financing, or that the jobs are not going to be created. But where I really see the issue coming in hand is in the loan documents or the investor documents themselves to see whether or not the basic protections are there in the event things go wrong to protect the, uh, the investor or lender, as the case may be. And that's just an analysis of the agreements that you need to take a look at. Right. I guess I guess what I'm what I'm getting at there is if I'm the general partner, but I'm also the borrower, and I make a loan for thirty million dollars, and then all of a sudden the project doesn't do well, can't meet the debt service, can't pay the interest payments, or can't repay the loan, then I can modify the loan agreement, restate it, make changes that, you know a normal lender wouldn't make because I'm also the borrower. So, you know, I'm, I'm acting as the developer trying to make money for my project, but I'm also acting as the kind of steward of the EB-5 investor funds. And if there's no con, if there's, if there is that conflict and it's been waived, 
right, then I'm probably going to do what's better off for me as a developer because that's where I'm going to make money. And I'm probably going to do what's worse off for the EB-5 investors. That and is that situation. And, that, and that's yeah, why I'm saying that, there needs to be some, some um, look at the loan agreements and the covenants to see that they're fair and balanced, right? Because if I'm wearing two hats, um, I am likely, in the event things are not going uh, as, as, you know, as they should, if you will, um, to be wearing my general partner hat more than my, you know, taking care of my investor hat, right? Um, and those are serious conflicts. Now, do they often come into play? The answer is no, not all the time, but you need to assess it on a job-by-job -job basis. Yeah, exactly. exactly well, Bruce. And this is something that, that, that we like to think about is when everything goes right, everyone's happy. There, when, when there's no problems, there's no problems. What you really need to look out for is when things actually go wrong, how do the chips fall? Because again, that, that doesn't get uncovered until it's too late. That's, that, that's correct. And I will tell you oftentimes when we advise um, general partners that may have those conflict of interest, we will come to the table and almost wear the investor hat and say, hey, you need to market and sell this project. You need to be competitive with other projects. The terms and conditions need to be fair so that the investor does have the basic protection protections in place should things not go um, as, as they should. Um, most of the time, I will tell you that the uh, GPs will, will follow that kind of advice. Um, most of the time. But that's good. Yep. Yep, exactly. Got it. All right, so let's move on to the to the structure chart just so we can make this a little bit you know, visual for investors yeah, to understand. Uh, I, think, I think this chart is getting a, a perfect picture of what of what you just described, right? So here you have the general partner on the on the left side of the screen um, controlling the NCE or the partnership, right? But also having some sort of control or affiliation into the developer, and you know that's where the added financial risk um, is going to exist and and a deeper dive. Uh, into the uh, loan agreements or the investment agreements uh, should take place in order to make sure that you're being fairly protected. Got it. Yeah, and one one general point I just want to make on that is that you know if if the general partner does have that type of a conflict, like generally they would have the ability to amend, restate, make adjustments to that loan agreement. And so in that situation, just by nature of just having that one right to be able to do that, while also knowing that they also control the borrower. So two people would have to agree, but in this case, both of those people are the same person. Then just the nature of being able to make those amendments without any third party check or oversight, just like the US government has checks and balances, that type of decision with no check and balance because it's being made by the same person means that no matter what's in the documents the investor is going to initially approve, that could all completely change later when the developer decides to change the terms of the loan unilaterally, right? So just, just yes. that ability at the beginning means you're opening yourself up to an unlimited unknown amount of changes that have no oversight. Correct. So hey, Bruce, in see that red flag, you want to look into the loan documents to make sure that the mater material changes are going to require um, the general partner to basically go back to um, the lenders, if you will, um, for consent, at least majority consent. Exactly. So, so what are a few other provisions you think would be absolutely critical to if there is going to be that developer wearing two hats? What are some of those other provisions that you would strongly recommend those clients put in to make it more balanced? even though there is that conflict? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a pretty broad, broad question. I mean, we would take, we'd want to take a look at all the affirmative covenants and the negative covenants that are within the loan agreements that are going to tie the hands of the, of the, uh, of the developer um, to make uh, unilateral changes that impact yep. the uh, ability of the project to, number one, uh, move forward as a, as a going concern, or number, number two, uh, that adds risk to, to the lender. Um, and so that's that's sort of a, a unique it's a unique analysis that got to be done in every doc in every project I should say right um, this is not a, a case of it's not going to be the same for every project um, so you need to look right. at the covenant specific to that particular project because the developer may give you you know one or two covenants that uh, that that are balanced and you know five others that are not um, and and so right. you really need to take a careful analysis and look at it right so said differently. If a project does have that conflict of interest where the general partner is the developer, 
they need to hire you, get you involved, look through the documents and make sure there's nothing you know, really, really unfavorable that would allow some of these unilateral changes that could really put their funds at risk. Yes, and, and we could sit there and, and guide you in terms of what's market standard because we do enough of this that we know what other projects are doing. Um, and we could say, look, this is completely out of market and should not be acceptable. Uh, perhaps you should be looking at another EB-5 investment. Um, or this is something that we generally see, but you know, um, we normally can you know, tweak it or put some caveat on it to provide some basic protections to you and move forward. Got it. Okay, that, 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 that's super helpful because obviously there are a number of projects in the market that do have this type of conflict of interest, like you know, blatantly present. So it is important for investors to just recognize that that requires an additional you know, level of, of scrutiny with someone who's familiar with what's happening you know, in the market today. Uh, you know, again, as I stated in the beginning, you, you need to sort of put on your own hat as a bank underwriter. Um, and do a deep dive into these documents because that's what's going to protect you at the end of the day. Yep, exactly. All right, so let's let's shift over to capital stack. So for those for those of our you know investors, oftentimes you know investors are engineers, they're you know musicians, they're poker players like Kate's client. You know they're not real estate development underwriters or investors. So kind of knowing that. You know what? What is a capital stack? You know what are what are these different components that investors really do need to familiarize themselves with before you know they can they can really make an educated decision about how their funds are going to be used in in the project. So this is really, from my perspective, one of the most critical aspects of of doing your review and an assessment of a project. Um, number one, you want to make sure that there's adequate collateral in place. Um, and that collateral has to have some real value because you have to assume going into this that things may not come out the way everybody wants. And so you have to assess the value of the collateral versus the risk that you're taking. Um, EB-5 capital is only going to be one part of the capital stack um, that we look at in, in a uh, EB-5 project. You know, usually see a portion of the capital stack being developer equity, another portion being a senior lender, uh, and then the third portion usually being the EB-5 uh, investor or lender making up the, uh, the the difference, if you will, the gap in, in, in those two numbers. Um, many times we see projects where part of the collateral package is a guarantee. To the extent that there's a guarantee involved, as I indicated earlier, you want to dive deep into the uh, financial status of the guarantor. You want to look at those uh, financial statements and determine whether or not those financial statements are strong enough to stand behind the risk that you're going to be assessing. Another thing to look at here is, of course, the, the, the cost of financing, right? A senior lender is also going to be doing its own underwriting as part of this project. Uh, so to the extent a senior lender is in place, it's going to do its own risk assessment. Um, and the terms that you're going to see from a senior lender oftentimes are going to reflect the risk that the bank thinks uh, is involved in this particular transaction. The higher the risk, the more stringent the loan terms are going to be and probably the higher the interest rate is going to be. Um, so as part of your analysis, you should be looking basically over the shoulder of the senior lender and see what they did and what concerns they have uh, to make sure that it's being properly addressed and analyzed by yourself um, as you look at the project. Got it. Okay, so a few few follow-up questions there. So first, just on the senior loan, you know, separate senior lender topic. Um, <clears throat> You know, having a senior lender in place obviously is a is a good thing, right? Um, yes. Can you kind of explain explain why that's the case, and you know how having that extra set of you know professional investment lens on the project is is valuable for investors? Well, I, I think just just as you indicated, right? The senior lender is coming in as professional. They do this for a living. They're going to assess the risk better than than you as a EB-5 investor who might be an engineer or professional or you know this is not your this is not your necessarily your skill set right so the senior lender is going to go through uh, an underwriting process it's going to go through a loan committee it's going to have a lot of financial analysts looking over you know the history of the developer the history of the guarantor their financial wherewithal uh, the risks of the project in that particular market uh, perhaps in that particular sector of the market. Um, so they're going to have a lot more familiarity and, and depth 
uh, in terms of the analysis that they're going to do. And you should take advantage of that um, and take a look at what their assessment um, has resulted in and, and use that as, you know, a leverage in, in assessing the risk on your on your own. I think it's, it's very helpful to have a senior lender in here. Um, senior lenders, by the way, uh, for the most part, like when EB-5 comes in because EB-5 is coming in underneath them. Um, and so the senior lender might have much less risk actually than the EB-5 investor who's coming in at mezzanine level. Um, one of the things I mentioned before that I do want to elaborate on again is the fact that when you look at the uh, loan documents from the senior lender, they're going to tend to have some very, very tight covenants in there, both financial covenants, um, negative covenants, affirmative covenants. One of the things that you see in a lot of senior lender programs today um, is whether or not the um, uh, loan to value ratio is maintained throughout the project, uh, what, the, what the debt ratio is going to look like going forward. And as the project changes, like in the situation we are in today, where you have higher interest rates, you have inflation with construction costs, a lot of projects are getting into situations where they're out of balance with the, the um, uh, with the financial metrics that are set by the bank, and the bank is coming back to the developer and saying, "Hey, we need more more capital, more equity capital underneath our capital stack." That's something that's I think important for investors to take a look at in these loan programs, um, because if that's here that it, within the senior loan document, then you need to be asking the question to um, to the project. Hey, what are you going to do? How are you dealing with this if there's going to be a gap in financing as we go forward? Um, because you may look like you're fully financed today, um, but a year or two down the road, you may not be. Um, and what does that mean to the project and my ability to you know, get the jobs I'm being guaranteed and, and of course, the completion of the project? Yep. So def definitely want to spend a few more minutes on this topic because I think this is a really, really critical point. And you've, you've hit on a couple of the, of the items. So, you know, in, in terms of like the most kind of applicable scenario, I always like to you know paint a real picture of where this is going to be a problem. You know, when 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 you tell me that you know projects you know nearing completion maybe, but interest rates are up and it's going to be dependent on you know an ability to refinance in the future, that that sounds like you know a project like a big apartment building or a big hotel maybe that was started three or four years ago. It was underwritten based on you know more conservative interest rate assumptions. Now you know maybe the project's going to be done in the next year, year and a half, two years, and you know now rates are much higher. You know how like what what happens in that situation when the building gets done, but then the values drop because of interest rates? Like how how does that situation play out for? you know, for, for a developer and why is it, you know, really important to look carefully at projects that are just dependent on a refinancing event, you know, very close to being completed. Um, so there's, I think there's a lot to your question. Let me, let me begin by saying that there, you know, there's never no assurance. There's always going to be risk, right? There's no risk list project going into these. Um, so I think it goes back to the uh, first slide that we looked at where we're talking about looking at the balance sheet of the developer and looking at the balance sheet of the guarantor, if there's one, uh, to make sure that they have the financial wherewithal mm -hmm. to get through, um, you know, uh, a, a downslide, if you will, in, in, the, in the market. Um, many of these projects with senior financing, if you get into a situation with the covenants, it is going to mean a refinance of the project. It may also mean an extension with the senior lender. The senior lender may be getting more uncomfortable and say, hey, you know, we'll give you an extension, we'll give you a forbearance, but it's going to be at some additional extra cost. Um, and the developer may have to go out to the marketplace outside the EB-5 investor to bring in some additional equity on its own, uh, which I've seen in many cases and done very successfully, uh, because as you're nearing completion of the project, you know, there's a high risk that that project's still going to be successful from an investor standpoint. Um, the margin on the profitability of the developer uh, might, might be reduced, um, but it's likely that if you're getting near completion, the developer is going to be able to finish that project through an alternate means of financing. And so those are just part of the analysis that I think you have to go through and get comfortable with. Did I answer them or not? Yeah, yeah, that, that that's great. So <clears throat> just last point on the senior loan. So, you know, just given the importance of that third party diligence on the project, you know, 
how important is it for an ED5 investor to actually get access to and review the senior loan agreement that's in place, you know, for for the project? Is that is that I th- you I know, think, a I think critical it's very item or? Yeah, I, I think it's very important. Um, I think it's very important to to not only look at the balance sheet, right, and make sure that there's plenty of developer equity there, um, but also to look at the uh, uh, loan conditions and loan covenants of a senior lender, because that's going to give you a lot of insight as to how a little senior lender is looking at this project, um, and that then translates into the, the you know a risk level, if you will, of this project being completed successfully. Got it. Got it. So, so, so a regional center sponsor, you know, telling an investor, hey, we've got a senior loan in place, but refusing to provide it, probably, probably not a good sign. I don't think that's a good sign. I believe in transparency. Got it. Okay. I guess, Kate, so shifting yeah, I mean, back to the immigration. This I mean, you know, let's, let's walk outside of the EB-5 investment realm. Okay. Um, if you're dealing, you know, if you're dealing with um, a second mortgage lender, um, or you know some sort of other subordinated lender using any alternative financing in any market, there's no way the deal's getting done without that subordinate mezzanine level investor looking at those senior loan documents. It's just not. <laughs> and I think after- so if it, it doesn't happen outside EB5, it shouldn't happen in EB5. It's critical. And I think that's the key point is, yes, this is an EB-5 investment. You're doing it for the benefit of the green card. But at the end of the day, this is just an investment. It should be the same diligence, same everything as a non-EB-5 investor for this type of deal. Exactly. So I think that is probably the most critical thing that you can say. That is that is absolutely correct. Yep. And the Don't same would apply huge. not just... Look, look under the hood. Right, exactly. So not not only the senior loan agreement itself, but also the balance sheets, the financial statements, so you can actually get an accurate picture of what's what's happening in the project at the time you invest. Correct. Right. And I know that, you know, it's not unfortunately it's not standard for many EB five projects to, you know, make available the financial statements as part of their documentation package, but that doesn't mean they don't have them or that they could share them if asked, right? Well, they certainly have them. If they don't want to share them, that's that's a big red flag. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So, Kate, sorry, I got cut off there. on On, on the topic of guarantees, you know, obviously there's the at risk requirement. You know, how does that link together with these guarantees that that are very common? I know this is a confusing topic. Funds have to be invested, but there can be a guarantee. You know what? Like, how, how does that all kind of make sense and is allowed? So funds have to be at risk of loss, right? That's what the law says. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean there can't be things like a completion guarantee or, you know, if the investment uh, application, the 526 is denied, uh, that you can't have a developer offer or a regional center that's working with a certain project offer to guarantee the return of funds in case of denial. What you can't guarantee is that 100% you will get your investment back. Um, you know, it's just, as you said before, treated like any other business investment. There's no guarantees. And uh, we've seen lots of funky structures where people come to us and, you know, they have the great idea that they're building a condo project and, you know, they want to say, if you invest the EB-5, you get either a discount or you get a condo. Immigration, you know, looks at those types of arrangements as a sort of guarantee because you're getting something that has the value of the investment. So it's very important to work with counsel to evaluate these types of arrangements and make sure if you see the word guarantee, that is structured in a way that is permissible under the EB-5 requirements. Got it. To add to that, Got of course, you know, senior lenders may often have a corporate guarantee or a personal guarantee as part of their uh, senior loan package. That doesn't guarantee they're going to get paid either because the guarantor may not have the wherewithal to uh, support the guarantee if there's a, you know, if there's a default on, on, on the senior loan. Uh, so that's why I think USCIS says, yeah, it's, it's still at risk of money. There's no guarantee you're going to get paid. It's just another form of collateral uh, to provide a little bit more comfort um, uh, that there is another financial source uh, to, to help uh, complete the project and, and, uh, and, and get paid at the end of the day. 
Right. Right. So all things equal, you know, comparing one project without a repayment guarantee, another one with it from a very large, you know, well capitalized entity. Obviously, you want the one that has the guarantee because that's going to limit or reduce your investment risk. Maybe not well, to zero. One that has the guarantee that also has a balance sheet behind the guarantor. Otherwise, it's right. not worth it. It's written on. Exactly. Exactly. And just so generally, the going back to the at risk kind of green card concept. You know, you could make a loan to a company like Microsoft, large company, well capitalized, big balance sheet. But theoretically, like Microsoft is still a going concern business, like they could still go under just like any other business in the right. United States. Very unlikely, but it's possible. And so that possibility satisfies the at risk requirement. Now, it's very low. Maybe it's one in 10 million that Microsoft is going to is going to go bankrupt, but it's possible. And that theoretical possibility of loss checks the box for keeping funds at risk. So you definitely don't need to take unnecessary risk, but you want to find a project ideally with a large, well-capitalized, separate guarantor with a balance sheet you can review that's going to give you, you know, enhanced financial security on, on your funds. Right. Okay. So switching gears now, we, we talked a little bit about the capital stack generally, but you're, you're the expert on this, Bruce. Kind of give us the, the, the different flavors and how, how you see EB-5 you know, kind of fitting in in most, in most situations today. Sure. So the, the chart that, that uh, you depicted here, Sam, it, it is pretty standard in terms of how you see the sources of capital in, in uh, most of the EB-5 projects today. Um, the common equity... Um, is usually put up by the developer, um, and it could be a combination of cash and or perhaps land contribution, right? Because they, they may already own the real estate underneath it, and they're contributing the real estate to the project, and of course that has some, some real value. Um, so they may usually make up between, we usually see between 15 and 20% of, of the capital stack. Um, then you normally have um, the mezzanine debt level, and that could be either and or preferred equity uh, from an EB-5 investor um, or uh, a loan uh, from, from EB-5. And, and generally speaking, those two will work out to be about 35% of the capital stack. Uh, and then you might see the senior loan come in for 45 or 50% of the capital stack. Now, from a risk standpoint, what the investor has to understand is that the senior lender is senior because it's gonna get paid first if there's a default on the loan. Um, and whatever collateral exists, they're going to take grab of the hold of that collateral. Uh, they're going to pay themselves back before anybody else um, gets paid off. So when looking at this chart, you really look at it from a reverse standpoint. The senior lender is going to be first to get repaid. Then the mezzanine debt EB-5 uh, person will get um, a second bite at the apple. Then it goes to the preferred equity EB-5 um, investor and then, and then ultimately uh, back into the developer if there's any money left over in the project uh, upon, you know, uh, failure of the project or foreclosure. Most of the time, there won't be any equity in the deal. So when you look at the structure of the capital stack, um, if there is a EB-5 project that offers both preferred equity uh, and mezzanine and debt um, as, as part of their EB-5 uh, capital program, the preferred equity you're usually is going to have, you know, a higher coupon, a higher interest rate, uh, and perhaps some better terms because they're at higher risk of losing their money uh, than the mezzanine debt EB-5 investor, if that makes sense. Got it. Yep, yep. So so at that point, it's uh, really just- here, by the way, if, 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 if the developer if the developer's not putting their own money at risk next to yours, I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest in the deal. Um, you want them to lose their money um, because if their money is at risk, they're really incentivized to do everything they can to make a successful project, right? That's common sense. Yep. Yep, exactly. And so if there is the opportunity to choose, you know, between preferred equity, EB-5 or mezzanine debt, it's really just risk tolerance, right? If it's things go tolerance. wrong, you're, yep. you're safer, but you're chasing a higher return. And so you just got to have that, you know, family conversation and just decide, you know, what do I really want to prioritize here, green card, getting the money back or, you know, chasing a little bit higher, higher yield right. on the fund. That's correct. That's correct. That's an individual right. decision by the investor. Yep. Okay. We, we touched, I think we can, I think we can skip over this. We talked about, um, 
the capital stack generally. The one point I want to make on this slide is just having all the funds identified to build the project, particularly if it's a single structure, like a hotel or an apartment building, like having all those documents executed in place, money being funded, so that you at least know that the structure is going to get done, that's really critical. Um, especially if your money's coming in early, because if there is no senior loan that's actually in place and all the equity is actually there, then the project could get stalled, like Kate, Kate described earlier, or it could just not ever happen at all, in which case funds could get lost, no jobs created, and, and green card problems. So making sure the project is fully financed uh, is, is critical. And obviously photos, you know, seeing what's going on on site is important, but looking at the paperwork and verifying, you know, looking at the balance sheet, the financial statements to see is this thing actually working and is all the money really there is, 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 is critical. Uh, just before you leave that point, Sam, I, I want to just add one, one other thing. And that is, even if the project is fully financed, looks great, right? Good developer, strong track record, it's fully financed, but still ask the question, the what if question. What if something happens during the project and it's not fully financed for whatever reason? Um, you know, is there going to be additional bridge money that can come in, additional equity money that can come in uh, from the developer, you know, to, to close that gap and, and really make this a success? So don't forget to ask That's the what great. if how the project is. That's a great point. And some of the other things is it might look fully financed, but do they actually have a GMAX contract where there's a fixed price right. or if costs go up, is the developer going to be in a situation where they're $20 million short? So that's a very important point. Right. Or or construction got delayed, the budget went up, and now they have to refinance within six months of being open, of opening an apartment building or hotel. And now, you know, yes, they got fully financed, they built it, but then they're facing a very you know difficult situation of paying back their loan in a short period of time right Correct. so that's why it, that's why it's really important no, no more advances to you until you do x y and z right and and so we have to plan for those and under understand what those risks are right and that's where really reviewing the current senior loan agreement and any other financing agreements is important you know to realize it's like buying a car you know it looks great it's driving but then if you look under the hood you see the spark plug is almost dead and so you know one more turn around the block and then it's going to shut off same same concept right okay so um walk, walk us through a little bit you know how how a project you know typically looks without eb5 and then you know how it looks with with eb5 you know, coming in? What is, because obviously there are a lot of projects that happen without EB5, right? So what what is that yeah. kind of difference yeah. typically look like? Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think your chart shows, right? The left hand of the chart shows what happens, uh, what a project looks like, you know, before EB5 investment comes in. You're still going to have that 15 to 20% equity from the developer. Um, the senior loan could be as high as, you know, 75% with, with no mess equity in there. Um, but oftentimes there is a preferred equity piece um, or other sort of subordinated uh, loan piece uh, that may come in behind the senior loan and, and you know, above the developer equity. Um, and this is generally what you would see. Uh, so the senior lender would basically be between, you know, 50 and 80 percent, developer equity 15 to 20 percent. And then there's um, usually going to be some sort of either bridge financing, um, subordinated lender or preferred equity for the, for, for the gap. Uh, Many times that mess piece uh, will be the bridge financing that we're going to take out if we are then going forward with an EB-5 project, which is the right-hand side of your chart, right? The EB-5 loan is basically coming in and replacing uh, that uh, that uh, mezzanine level financing. Got it. And so the the other kind of main point I want to make on this in this chart is that, like, ideally from a risk mitigation perspective you want to look for a deal where you've got the whole capital stack identified without EV5 and the project isn't necessarily dependent on any specific amount of EV5 coming in at any specific point, right? Because then you know yeah, that- I think that's an excellent point. You know, we see a lot of projects where you, you might, the developer might put in their 15, 20%. He has the senior loan commitment in, in place. Um, and perhaps the senior loan commitment, like I said, could be more than 50%. It could be 70 or 80%. Uh, but the EB-5 is going to come in now. Their portion of the 35 could pay off 
either a portion of the senior lender um, or that mezzanine level, right? So to the extent that it's 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 fully financed going in, that all that all looks that all looks great. If you're going into a project um, where it's not quite fully financed because they're depending upon um, the EB-5 loan uh, to come into place, you have a higher risk as the EB-5 investor because then we have to say to the developer is so how do you finance this thing if you're depending upon you know $20 million of EB-5 money and you only get $10 million of EB-5 money. How do you bridge that gap? If the developer hasn't done that and put those commitments in place beforehand, you're substantially increasing your risk that the project's not going to be uh, completed and the jobs are not going to be created. Got it. And so, you know, on that point, like, are there enough projects, you know, in the market where investors could go into a project that wasn't dependent on on EB-5? Like, is that is that pretty common or or very uncommon since it's obviously a major you know driver of risk uh that's a, that's kind of an interesting question i want to say that i've seen a change in the marketplace i would say that in in the past um it was more uncommon to have the project fully financed uh and projects were more dependent upon eb5 coming in i want to say today um, then I'm seeing a trend where there's many more fully financed projects um, that exist in the marketplace. Um, but again, that's that's sort of a regional center by regional center uh, assessment yep. uh, because some regional centers um, are more stringent in looking for projects that have, you know, the full finance capital stack in place um, before they go and risk, you know, uh, the, the marketplace. Um, because it impacts obviously their reputation um, as well as their uh, ability of the investors to get the jobs in there and the return on their money. So, yep. so I think I think yep. you need to look at the regional centers very carefully and you need to look at the projects very carefully um, to make sure that they sort of fit into um, the requirements that we were talking about uh, in this presentation. Got it. So all things equal, you want to find a project that's fully financed and not dependent on EB5 as an investor. Just yes. you can... You, your project meets that, like you've you've eliminated a major source of potential risk. This game is all about minimizing risk, not eliminating it, because that's not going to happen. But you don't you you want to minimize it. Um, you know, if you go into this blind, you know, you're going to end up in a situation where uh, you may not be happy in a couple of years. I just want to yep. add. Uh, also, we've seen projects fail at this point in the program. We've seen projects not be able to secure funding, to be severely delayed. Uh, so investors are savvier too. Investors watch the market. They have chat groups. They all communicate and they're attuned to it, whether they're in the U.S. or they're overseas. Uh, so they're very much involved in monitoring stuff. So their sort of also appetite for projects to you know, be in different stages has also changed over time. Got it, and that, that that's a great point. There definitely has been a shift over the last couple of years in terms of, you know, the quality of projects that are coming to market and the level of sophistication. And also, you know, from our perspective, like we're always trying to just increase transparency. There can never be enough transparency or you you, you can never provide enough right? You're always chasing that mirage in the desert. Um, and so, you know, in the last year, we've done a lot to really, you know, try to increase that as much as possible so that our clients, you know, have all the information on our projects that they need to make an informed decision, but also just generally are educated, you know, with what questions they should be asking, you know, not just for us, but for any, any potential project that they're, that they're considering. Um, all right, great. So I think I think now we'll, we'll we kind of we're a little bit running over time. So we'll we'll quickly run through these few slides on on one of our current projects, uh, and then we'll open up just for a few questions at the end. So um, one of the one of the most exciting projects that we've worked on, uh, you know, pretty much over the last ten years, is our new Twin Lakes, Georgia loan uh, EB5 rural project. Um, this is a project with the Culture Group. Uh, they're one of the largest developers uh, in the southeastern United States. We've worked with them uh, exclusively over the last 10 years on 14 prior 
EB-5 investment projects, all of them uh, with 100% USCIS uh, project approval. This particular project is a large single family home community uh, with amenities. You can see a photo, an aerial photo there on the left hand side. The project's been under development uh, since 2019. There's 1,300 uh, single family homes total. Uh, as of uh, end of June, more than 520 homes have already been sold. Almost 400 homes have already been built. Uh, and so you can see that the project you know, is very far, very far advanced. Um, it does qualify as rural, so it is in a rural TEA location. EB-5 is approximately 12% of the total cost. There is an executed senior loan in place with Third Coast Bank. Uh, previously, there was also uh, a separate senior loan with Wells Fargo Bank, one of the most conservative uh, commercial lenders uh, in the United States. Almost 2,000 EB-5 eligible jobs have already been created as of March. And uh, we talked a little bit earlier about you know, the benefits of going into a project where a lot of job creation has already happened. That job creation is the result of over $200 million of project costs already been spent to date in the project. And that results in each of our EB-5 investors joining the project today, knowing on the first day that they join the project that they already have more than the 10 jobs they need individually to complete the entire EB-5 process. Um, so those are those are a couple of the kind of key key aspects of of the project. Um, Twin Lakes is one of 13 Crestwind communities. Crestwind is a active adult retirement community brand developed and owned by uh, the Coulter Group. They have 13 uh, total uh, communities like this where they're targeting active adults, basically wealthy 55 and up uh, seniors. Uh, who are retiring in warmer weather, warmer climate. You can see all these projects are located in the Southeast United States. And the main kind of takeaway here is that this is a proven formula. Coulter has been doing this for years, highly, highly successful. Um, the Twin Lakes project is already profitable. We're happy to make available all the financial statements for the project, uh, as well as a separate guarantor entity that's guaranteeing the repayment of the funds. Um, so it's a proven model. There is demand for these homes. It's already happening. Uh, hundreds have already been built and sold. A couple of um, unique aspects of the project. Um, one of Coulter's parent companies is providing three um, key guarantees. So one is a repayment of the loan. So even though EB-5 funds are being used in this project to satisfy EB-5 program rules for job creation, uh, the actual promise and obligation to repay the funds is from a much larger, well-capitalized parent company that has significant assets and owns almost 40 different Coulter development projects. So unlike many EV5 projects where money is being loaned to a single address and for the money to come back to you, that specific building, hotel, whatever it is at that one address has to be successful in order for you to get repaid. In our project, that promise is from a much bigger diversified entity. It's essentially like investing in an index fund instead of one stock. Um, so you have that protection uh, for both the repayment of the funds at the end of the loan, as well as the 5260 approval refund guarantee. Essentially, if an investor is denied uh, for any reason, including you know source of funds issue, but we know that won't happen if you hire Kate and her team, then you're getting repaid. Uh, much faster in a matter of months instead of waiting uh, until the end of the investment. And then lastly is the job creation guarantee, um, although that really isn't very applicable because we've already created all the jobs uh, already. Um, so, you know, that 829 permanent green card approval risk has, has you know, been, been effectively removed. Um, this is a little more information about the guarantee. I know we chatted about it earlier in the webinar with Bruce, um, but the mechanics for how how this works, their separate entity owns a substantial number of projects. That entity is promising to repay the EB-5 investors. So you can see the direct link between that promise to repay with our EB-5 fund uh, in which each EB-5 investor is a partner. Um, and just most importantly, this entity is well capitalized, hundreds of millions of dollars of assets. We have the financial statements which we can make available for investors to review. Um, but then even more important than that, 
is that Coulter as a company, over the last 25 plus years, they've invested in over 180 projects, 24 billion, including over 20,000 homes. This particular project is 1,300 homes. They've successfully repaid billions of dollars in debt. They borrow funds from five of the top 10 largest US banks. They've never failed to repay a loan or complete a project in the last 30 years, right? So although it is possible that you know they don't complete a loan repayment in the future or complete a project in the future, it's unlikely. Um, so there still has to be an element of risk as we discussed earlier. So the best you can do is find a company that's been doing that specific business on a large scale for a long period of time and has never not repaid, right? That's kind of the best the best you can do in terms of financial financial safety. On the job creation side quickly, as I mentioned, we're already above the total jobs that are needed. We need 1,510 total. We're already almost at 1,900 and these numbers are several months old. Total job creation is almost 7,000 when the project is done. And then from a unit economic perspective, it's always just critically important. All these financial documents, hundreds of pages, you know, there's a lot of different moving pieces, but just stepping back, you know, use common sense. Is this project going to be successful in the economy, right? What is the basic business of the project? In this case, we're building and selling retirement homes for seniors. You have to be 55 and up to buy a home. So if you think that over the next 10 years, there's going to be wealthy seniors who are going to buy new homes in warm weather in tax-free states, you know, that's going to match with what your investment preference is, right? Do you think that that is going to be feasible? Obviously, you'd want to look at what homes have sold so far. Has it been profitable? And, you know, obviously the information for this project shows that substantial homes have been sold. It's already profitable. You know, so the odds of it continuing to be profitable, you know, is a little bit more clear uh, because we have that track record. But the same question needs to be assessed, you know, whether it's an apartment project, you know, in New York City or a hotel in the Bay Area. You know, do you think that there's going to be demand for that product in that market? Because if there's not demand, it really doesn't matter what all the papers say. If the project just economically is not going to make money, then you're going to have you're going to have problems, right? So just big picture, just always keep that in mind. If you pick a project that just financially succeeds and just makes sense from a business perspective, and you can see that it's working, you're going to be in a much better position than in a project that just doesn't have that product market fit and is not or going to be a very difficult path to becoming profitable um, you know, post, post investment. And Mike, I'm sure you've got some thoughts. I'll let you jump in. Yeah, no, thanks. I think that was a good summary, Sam. And what I'd say is that we've been in this industry for a long time. And now with the new rural set asides, it's really important just to evaluate what type of projects are likely to be successful in the current environment, much higher interest rates than before. Um, the economy isn't quite as strong as it used to be. And just evaluating deals based on, as Sam mentioned, common sense, like what makes sense from a macro perspective, what area the countries are growing which ones aren't, and then also really getting into the legal documents and figuring out that on the immigration side, how do you mitigate all the risk or as much as possible, and same on the financial side. And as a company, we pride ourselves in being that independent third party who evaluates deals from all over the country, from all different types of developers, and only selecting the ones that we feel match what we're looking for. Yep, and digging in, you know, looking under the hood, um, you know, the, the famous saying that I like to come back to is trust but verify, right? It looks good from the outside, but, you know, let's take a look at those financial statements, you know, where are these assets, you know, what are the requirements for assets to remain there, you know, how do I make sure that, you know, the information I'm being told over the phone, you know, by a salesperson is actually accurate. You know, they told me the project does have a senior loan, but they haven't given me the senior loan agreement. Or, you know, they told me that, you know, there's a guarantee in place, but they're not willing to share the financial statements. You know, not willing to share any requested documents, typically not, not a good sign, right? So all things equal, you want to go with a project that's at least going to give you all the information 
that you could possibly look at to make an informed decision. And that's just a kind of core foundational piece of how we approach these investments. And we hope that in the future that, you know, we'll kind of be setting that trend where, you know, that will become kind of a standard for investors to ask for financial statements and other records, you know, to really dig in and verify details about projects, because we really think that will give investors, you know, the best shot at making, you know, the, the best decisions that they that they can. Um, Bruce and Kate, um, I think we've got, a, we've got a couple questions, but before we get into the questions, yeah, I guess what would be kind of, you know, just your one or two, you know, main points for investors considering, you know, picking a project from an immigration perspective and then, you know, from, from the financial perspective as, as well. I think from an immigration perspective, track record is important. The RIA, we didn't get into it, but has a new, uh, has a lot of new requirements with respect to compliance and making sure that the regional center is in good standing, making sure that the job creating entity and new commercial enterprise are in good standing. Um, and also for past projects, they're a good indicator of how future projects are gonna do on the immigration side. Who are they, who are they working with? How many times have they done this? Have they done it successfully? These are all super important questions that nobody should shy away from asking. Sam, I thought you did an excellent job in your summary in terms of high, highlighting what the financial risks are as well, right? Um, don't believe the sales pitch, as I said earlier. Um, you know, sometimes it's surprising uh, to, to get feedback on, on what investors may be hear, hearing from the sales side versus what the loan documents or the investor documents are actually stating. Um, so you need to be careful. You need to do your homework. You need to put on your bank underwriter hat and do a deep dive. Um, into the financial covenants of the senior lender uh, in terms of the guarantees and collateral that are, are, are being offered to the mezzanine level um, loan, loan investors. And uh, really look at the background of the developer, their successful track record, the track record of the, you know, the regional center, uh, how transparent everybody is being, providing all the documentation um, that you should be getting uh, as part of your due diligence package. Um, and, and I think that really about sums it up. Just be careful. Got it. Got it. And, and on that on that point, you know, helping you know review those types of documents. How can you? I, I asked Kate this earlier too. But how do you how do you work with clients who want, you know, obviously, let's say they're working with Kate on getting their petition together. But you know, let's say they've narrowed it down to two or three projects. But you know, they're they're a physician, you know, from Egypt, and they don't really have any idea where to, you know, or how to go about accurately comparing one project to the other how do you how, how do you work with a client like that that just really wants to safeguard their funds and make sure they're getting fair fair terms yeah so what we can do and what i've done in the past is i, I basically put together a pros and cons list for for each of the projects obviously we cannot make the investment decision for for the client right because um that's that's not our scope that's not our role um the in, the investor has to make that investment decision on their own but we can point them, um, and we try to do this in a summary fashion, with just a pros and cons checklist of, of points that they should be looking at, uh, what we think has been covered or not covered uh, in, in particular law documents, and walk them through it to give them the best information um, that we can and guide them to making an intelligent investment decision. Got it, got it. Okay, so I'm just looking through the questions here. I think we actually covered a lot of these. Um, so a couple of just common sense ones that I can just quickly address here. So we, 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 we will make these slides available. Um, so if you are interested in getting uh, a copy of these slides, you can, you can send an email uh, to me and I can, I can provide you with a copy of, of the slides. Uh, hold on, let me just, or you can just email the email address, sorry, on the screen here, info at EB5AN. To send a request for the slides, and we're happy to happy to provide those. Uh, and then there were a couple of questions about video recording. This will be, uh, or this has been recorded, and we will be doing a post with this entire video along with the uh, PowerPoint download. Probably will take a few days uh, for us to get that organized, but eventually, you know, probably in a week or so, it will be uh, featured on our blog, and we'll also have, you know, the contact details for Kate uh, and Bruce. 
for any investors who are who are interested in um, getting started on a on an EB five application. Um, just looking down the list of questions here. Yeah, I know we're way over. So I think I think any 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 specific questions that we weren't able to cover, please reach out uh, to Kate and Bruce. Their contact information email uh, is on the screen, and they'll be able to help point you in the right direction in terms of evaluating projects uh, and getting started with a new I five two sixty petition. And then anything related to uh, the project side. So any questions related to the Twin Lakes. Georgia Rural Project, please uh, feel free to reach out via email. You can go on our website, book a call, uh, shoot a text or a WhatsApp message to us and we can uh, get you more information, uh, all the offering documents, senior loan agreements, balance sheets, uh, everything is centrally stored in a single Dropbox folder that we're happy to uh, provide access to you uh, and any attorney or consultant that you have. Uh, and then, yeah, I think I think that, that's that's about it. Mike, anything else before we wrap up? No, I think that's great. Thanks again. We know this was a long one and appreciate everybody that stayed on for the whole webinar and look forward to uh, speaking again soon. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Kate and Bruce. Us. Sorry we're, thank you sorry for we're us. over time here, but yeah, I think we, we got a lot of good information out there. So we really appreciate it.